everyone. Welcome back. We are here with another webinar from Divers Alert Network. My name is Caitlin, and today I am here with our Director of Hyperbaric and Underwater Safety, Francois Berman, and our Risk Mitigation Coordinator, Chloe Strauss. And they're here to tell you all about preparing to dive in the new normal, and they're going to be answering some of our most frequently asked questions. Hey, guys. Hey there, Kate. If I can maybe just set the scene before we start with the questions. We've had a, a little bit of feedback from the industry in general about some of the materials we put up on the website. And in particular, some folks are in, um, interpreting the recommendations that we put up there as being requirements. And Dan doesn't put up requirements. We really are trying to answer the questions that have been asked of us in terms of what would you do in this particular situation. And of course, we don't know what everybody's situation is. So the logical way to do this, this, the way we encourage people to approach this is to assess their own risks because different operations have different risks, different requirements, and each of them are going to be unique. So consider if you're going to have an exposure to, in this case, the virus. And if you've, if you've got an exposure, how likely is it that you're going to get some form of transmission of the infection? And then the consequence clearly is going to be somebody being infected, which is going to be bad for, for business and obviously for the people involved. So instead of thinking that you have to comply with 10 or 20 or 30 different items and put up a checklist that covers everything, we'd like for you to know that you need to focus on just the issues that apply to you and not try to you know, feel that you have to do everything under the sun to make sure that your business is safe. And also remember for you business operators out there, if you can convince your clients that you have their safety at heart, they're going to feel much more comfortable to dive with you. And even if it requires a little bit of preparation, maybe some signs up on the wall, a proper briefing, that'll go a long way to make those clients cooperative and feel that you've really kind of got things under control. And then just the last point that I think some of the questions that Kate has in mind, you will be able to see um, Descriptive answers to that on our website. There's a Q&A section on our website, and Kate will give you some of those links a bit later. So back to you, Kate. All right, thanks for that, Francois. So I guess we'll go ahead and get into our Q&A portion. So uh, Dan, we've received a lot of questions from divers and dive professionals alike. And uh, we'll go ahead and start with this one, and I'll, I'll give it to you, Francois. Um, this has been given to us so many times, and it is, can rental equipment still be rented and used safely in wake of this pandemic? Okay, as was most, most things that we get to face, there, there are many answers, but the, the short answer is probably yes, but that's gonna be if you can at least consider and think about some of the things that I mentioned to you now, because ultimately it's going to be about infection control. You want to make sure that whether it's a BC that they are, BCD that they're renting or a wetsuit, which is perhaps a little bit more complicated than things like masks and snorkels, it goes around the proper disinfection um, procedure that you follow and really importantly, the proper disinfectant. And we've had you know, many questions about disinfectants that Chloe's been fielding because not all disinfectants are suitable for use, for example, on a wetsuit. So that's probably the one that you want to think about a little bit more when it comes to rental equipment. And if you rent out wetsuits, you probably want to have a, a procedure in place for that. But it's not just about disinfection. It's also about perhaps controlling the access of the clients to your rental area that you pass out the, the equipment to them rather than them coming to look through all your equipment. If they do need to fit something on, then clearly if it's a mask, it'll need to be wiped off. If it's a wetsuit, it probably then needs to be disinfected. Um, one must assume in all cases that these clients could theoretically be you know, carrying the virus with them. And then I would add to that, Keeping a record of who rents what from you, from you. So if it does come back later that they have, um, you know, been found to be positive in terms of testing, that you know which equipment that's likely to have uh, to have affected, and then maybe packaging. Once they've got their rental gear, you package it up for them. Make sure that only they get to handle it, and that they also know when they return it, you know, to put it aside in a specially dedicated quarantine area that you can then manage the proper disinfection. So. You really want to keep your finger on what is going on. The most important thing is disinfection. And yes, we have found disinfectants out there that will cover pretty much everything that we've seen that needs to be disinfected. Good. This so, is all good stuff to know. Um, and I guess we can go ahead and move to our next question. And Chloe, this one's a good one for you. Um, I'm pretty sure you'll have the answer to this. 
And it's, should an individual mouthpiece be used for every client who uses a regulator? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so, you know, individual mouthpieces are a great thing to have on hand. And if it's gonna make you feel better, if it's gonna make your clients feel better, or, you know, if you're a diver, it's gonna make you feel better, then, you know, absolutely use it. Whether or not it will protect you from like catching the virus from a contaminated piece of equipment, Probably not completely anyway. Um, so if you think about kind of the, the anatomy of a, of a second stage regulator, you are biting down on that mouthpiece, but when you exhale, the droplets that you exhale are gonna go inside of the regulator of the second stage and you know, kind of hang out in there before you exhale them. Um, so there is gonna be potential contamination inside of that second stage. So if you're just changing the mouthpiece, it's not gonna be enough to really reduce the risk of, of transmission from the equipment. So in addition to using individual mouthpieces, you should also be disinfecting your equipment. Right. So now we're moving on to a lot of people rent gear when they travel, but most divers have their own gear. So how do we recommend that uh, people manage the disinfection of their personal equipment? And what should dive operators do if they don't, if uh, clients refuse to use uh, the disinfectant solution available? When you have, um, you know, your own personal equipment, disinfection is still really important. Um, you know, when you're on a boat with a lot of people, stuff can be flying around, there's wind, you don't really know what's going to be on it. Um, especially if you've had the virus and you, you know, get better and you start diving in again, you're going to want to give your, uh, your equipment a, a good disinfection. Um, if you're an operator, the thing that we would be the most concerned about is... Um, Right. So if you have a where we know the virus can potentially survive in fresh and salt water. We don't really know for how long. We don't know really if you can, can get it from these rinse tanks. So the best thing to do would be, you know, assume that you can. So if your clients aren't wanting to use your disinfectant solution for their own personal equipment, you know, really my way or the highway kind of attitude wouldn't be unwanted here. So you can offer to give it a spray with the hose um, or they can take it home and disinfect it, you know, in their own shower or backyard or whatever. Um, but I think that just allowing them from putting their equipment into the communal rinse tank without first disinfecting it shouldn't should. All right, so it looks like we're having a little bit of audio trouble, so sorry about that. Sorry for the technical difficulties ahead of time. We are streaming this uh, from three different places. Um, but thanks for that, Chloe. Uh, we're going to keep moving through this, and hopefully um, these issues will get resolved pretty quickly. Um, but Francois, this question comes to you, and a lot of people are wondering, can the virus enter cylinders during filling processes? And if so, what practices and what measures should they take to prevent this from happening? This has been an interesting question to answer, uh, Caitlin. We've had it asked from many different um, people and even from some of the compressor manufacturers themselves. They're kind of curious to know what our take on this is. So the short answer is going to be it's highly unlikely. There are no absolutes in life. And even though there are many things that will happen to that virus particle, um, it's unlikely that it's going to come out the other side um, being still being infective. And obviously, you will then breathe it in from your cylinder. So let me just sketch out a few of the things that this virus particle is going to need to have happen for, for it to actually get through successfully. The intake to the compressor is where it all starts. And if somebody, let's say somebody sneezes near the intake, it shouldn't happen. Your intake should be positioned safely. But for whatever reason, somebody's now passed some of the virus particles into the air and it's been drawn in into the intake. There is an intake filter, but that unfortunately is only going to catch the larger particles. And we know from research 
that some of the particles are right down to half a micron, if not smaller. In fact, more than 15% of them are going to be around the one 2.5 micron size. So they're going to get through the inlet filter. Not all of them, but certainly some of them. Then the interesting part starts, and this is where those of us with technical minds like to kind of get a bit involved in that. When the compress is cold, before it gets warm, the metal temperature is going to be relatively cool, although it heats up very, very cold. And we know that a good warm running compressor, we can have surfaces between 150 to 200 degrees Fahrenheit, depending obviously on the condition of the compressor. That is not hot enough to, it is hot enough to kill the virus, but not unless you keep it there for, for many minutes. However, inside the actual compression cylinder itself, we have very um, rapid compression, much the same as in a diesel engine. You ignite that mixture purely from the compression of the gas at high speed because it leads to what is called adiabatic compression, or we call it the heat of compression. And that depends on how many stages, it depends on the, on the um, compression ratio and a bunch of other things. But you can safely assume you're going to be getting around about 360 degrees Fahrenheit in the peak of that temperature. It's not going to make the wall 360, but the, the air at that instant will hit around about 360, and in most cases, even higher than that. And even though it's for a tiny period of time, it's certainly hot enough to, we believe, um, damage the envelope around the virus. And of course, it goes through three or four of these cycles. So at each one of these cycles, the chance of it being obliterated is going to, to increase. Don't forget, we have our interstage coolers and drains where the liquid that's in the air is going to condense out and end up in the um, in the condensate or the drains that we use to capture that. So we expect if there is any live uh, virus, you might find some of it in the interstage drain. Again, there'll be three or four of those. Then there's the outlet filter, which again doesn't have the micron size, but it doesn't mean that when that virus particle strikes the absorbent agent, the molecular sieve, it's not going to stay there. And eventually it's, it's going to die because the heat in there is going to be fairly consistent. And then finally, if it does make it through to the cylinder, remember that we all know our cylinders heat up when they're being filled. And that again is adiabatic compression. We try to minimize that by relatively slow filling of cylinders, but that heat will, will remain in that cylinder for a while. And we have, we have some debate out there, let's put it that way, about cooling cylinders during filling. On a small cylinder, that's pretty effective. On a large cylinder, 12 liter, types of cylinders we dive with, the internal temperature is going to remain warm for, for a fairly lengthy period of time. And so while there are no absolutes, I mean, you can even put in some disinfecting processes, the chances are very, very, very unlikely that any virus will end up in the cylinder. However, that's not the only way that you can get virus into a cylinder. So think of the filling technician comes to work sneezing and clearly, you know, the chance of him having virus on his hands is going to be relatively high unless he practices good hygiene. And if the technician were to touch the outlet of the filling rope where it touches to the cylinder valve or touches the cylinder valve, then there'll be virus particulate on that interface. And so the air will blow the virus into the cylinder. So it is not impossible for there to be virus in the cylinder, but it's not going to come from the compression process, but from the filling process. And likewise, if when you're putting on your, your regulator onto your cylinder valve, if you or somebody does it for you and they infect it and they touch those surfaces, yes, again, the virus particles can end up going down um, your, hit your first stage. The filter on the first stage, again, is not fine enough and it'll end up in your second stage regulator. There is somewhat of a misconception that the virus can move in the other direction from the second stage back up the hose. That, that we know is impossible. So unless you know that you've definitely had some form of contamination, we don't ever advocate cleaning your first stage or you trying to clean your first stage or your hoses. To clean a first stage means you have to disassemble it. That really gets done by the service technician. So as a general rule, if you're concerned, which is a good place to be, then you might want to consider a disinfectant wipe to clean the top of the, the cylinder valve before things are attached to it. But please, if I can implore you of one thing, I know it's available, but you do not want to have any alcohol near your cylinder valve, even if it's air, not nitrox. When you open that cylinder valve, you're going to again get adiabatic compression as the gas flows from the cylinder at 3,000 psi. It will stop suddenly when it hits 
your first stage and then the second stage is closed, your demand valve is closed, and any alcohol, even with just high pressure air, can lead to ignition. That ignition from what we call a heat of compression ignition is very real and please use some other form of disinfectant wipe. And that way I think you could be 99.999% assured it's not going to be your area of concern. You have many other areas of concern. This is the least of them. So theoretically, it's possible, but extremely unlikely given the compression process and other factors. And just to sum up pretty much what you just said in your really detailed and thorough answer, which we definitely appreciate, um, people just need to really focus on keeping their hands clean before handling and filling. Okay. And, and keep away from the inlet to the compressor. And that way, you know, these are things we can do. You know, it's not it's not going to be a, you know, some unfortunate incident. It's going to be somebody that's being reckless and careless, and we can manage that. Exactly. So I guess moving on to our next question: um, Would the use of protective gloves reduce the likelihood of materials and surfaces becoming contaminated within the dive business? Yeah. So. Um... Gloves only protect the hands of the person wearing them. So if I'm wearing gloves and I touch a surface that has the virus on it and then I touch something else, you know, the surface is still going to transfer. It's just when I take my gloves off, it might not be in my hands. So the way I like to imagine it is, you know, when you're painting, right? And if you maybe you've got gloves on, but you've been painting something, you get paint on your hands. That paint is going to transfer when I touch my phone and then I put it to my face, you know, that paint is now gonna be here, it's gonna be everywhere. And the same concept applies when you're wearing gloves. So if you wanna use gloves, that's great, you know, go for it. Is it going to protect your business or your home or anyone else from you still transferring the virus on your hands? No, it won't. Got it, that's some solid advice. And um, two things, safer for people around them and disinfected correctly. Should people be disinfecting wetsuits, gloves, and boots? Um, yeah, so disinfecting that kind of stuff certainly isn't going to hurt. Um, is it the primary way that we think that the virus can, can transfer on equipment? Probably not. Can it be contaminated with the virus? Sure, yeah, definitely. Absolutely. You're pulling your head or you've got gloves on to wipe your face. You know, um, yeah, you can get the virus that way. When you are disinfecting the or these you know, gloves, hoods, anything that's that kind of material, you want to make sure that you're using a disinfectant that is safe to use on those materials. When you take out a, um, you know, a disinfectant and you go into its registration, you want to make sure that it says wetsuit or neoprene for this specifically. And there are a few on there. Um, and if you guys need help, you know, navigating and the webinar that, or sorry, the first webinar that Dan did, which was two weeks ago, I believe, um, kind of walks you through the use of Listen and how to go about searching for products. So that would be a really good resource. All right, so we're getting some audio interference. Can you go ahead and repeat um, that last bit of your answer for me? Yeah. Apologies again for some of, we're getting some audio interference really bad through this, so I'm so sorry. Um, we are trying to manage that as best we can here. Um, all right, so for those who, of you who couldn't hear um, Chloe's answer, we're gonna repeat that one more time. So it's the main points as far as disinfecting neoprene wetsuits, gloves, and booties goes is as follows. Chloe, you there? Yes, yep, and I don't hear any more interference, so we'll try again. Um, yes, it's a great idea. Um, is it our main concern when it comes to uh, transmission of the virus on equipment? Probably not. Is it possible? Absolutely. Um, so when you're disinfecting these neoprene, you know, or other material kind of pieces of equipment, you wanna make sure that you're using a disinfectant that is safe to use on these pieces. So if you're looking for a disinfectant on list N, you have to go to the product registration and make sure that it specifies that it is safe to use 
on these materials. And there are a few on list end that are safe to use on wetsuits and, you know, other scuba equipment like BCDs. Um, you can also try contacting the manufacturer of your specific wetsuit, gloves, hoods, all of that kind of stuff for, for guidance there as well. But if you need help looking at the EPA registration and need help kind of navigating that, the first webinar that, that we did um, will walk you through that. So that'll be a really good resource. Perfect. And we can also post those links. Yeah, we can read you loud and clear. That was great. Um, we'll post those links for you guys in the description of this webinar as soon as it becomes a video. And if this is your first time tuning in, just to let you know, uh, this webinar will be available as a video that lives on our Facebook page. We also are uploading these to YouTube. Um, so you can share with your friends who might not be on Facebook. And uh, we'll be sure to include those pertinent links and the descriptions on both videos there. Okay. And just as a reminder to our audience, we're almost through some of our frequently asked questions that we're going through. But right after this, we'd like to open up the floor to you guys. So if you have questions in mind, go ahead and type them into the comments. We're going to try and get to as many as we can. Um, but for those who we can't hit in the time we have allotted for this today, um, just feel free to either reach out to us directly at riskmitigation at dan.org. Again, we'll post that email in the description right at the end too, um, or just stand by and we will get to you as soon as we can after this webinar. All right, so moving right along, what are some of the best ways to manage infection um, of staff and of clients in a dive business, Francois, what are some of the main points that you'd like our audience to take away today? Francois, are you there? I think so. Okay, perfect. Okay, so let me start where I'd always like to start, and that is if we take care of our staff, the staff in turn will take care of the clients. So we often think clients come first in terms of this, but we need to take care of our staff. The two main things to consider here, the first would be what we call surveillance. When folks come to work in the morning, just do it, you know, at this time, it's, I think in many cases, coming out of lockdown. And as we go forward, we're going to be checking that our folks that come to work are not sniffling, they don't have coughs, you know, they haven't been in contact with anybody. Some people might want to take temperatures, but we need to be observant of our staff when they come to work in the morning. That will kind of be your first step. And then you want to have procedures in place that everybody understands, they've been trained for, they understand the principles of disinfection. When necessary, they'll need to wear their PPE, their personal protection equipment, so it might be gloves, breathing something over their mouths or a face mask. And really importantly, that you maintain discipline in your operation, that people do what they're trained to do. You know, in the beginning, we come to work with a mask on, and by day three, we're tired of wearing the mask. And, People just start forgetting about all the important things. And then think of the working environment. So look at areas where people are likely to touch things. So if it's the technician, it'll be his workbench. If it's somebody at the front of the shop, it might be the counter at the shop or the, the till or screen if you're working on an iPad or some other form of smart device. So they all need to be, to be disinfected um, at the end of business each day so that when you come in the next morning, things at least are, are you know, disinfected. And then lastly, don't forget to interrogate your clients. So I don't mean interrogate in any negative way. I really just mean ask them the questions. If they're coming to dive with you, you know, are you aware um, of any infected people you might have come across? Have you traveled a long way on an airplane? Do you have any of the symptoms that we would typically associate with, you know, risky situations? And whether that's people coming into your shop, but you know, more likely divers. So that way, it's not only protecting the client, but making sure that your staff who work with the clients are going to um, you know, have the best chance of not being infected. In terms of the clients, um, what we would really advocate you do is look at your shop and perhaps restrict access to places where people went to before but really don't need to be. So try to locate them you know, in the areas where there's public space rather than the workshop and where cylinders are stored and so on, especially to non-divers. Um, your clients, you want to brief them as to how you run your operation, what are your disinfection procedures, and that you abide by them. So if they're not prepared to listen, then perhaps they should consider you know, going to dive somewhere else if they don't feel comfortable with you know, having to follow your disinfection routines and so on. I'd say be consistent in what you do so that one client doesn't say, well, you didn't do the same to another client, but everybody gets treated similarly. That's really a good defense when people think that you're picking on them for whatever reason. 
And then basic things like putting up signage, putting up disinfectants on the counter, you know, warning people with instructions, redoing the briefing when you get to the boat that these are the things that you need to be aware of. And that way, you'll take care of your staff, really importantly for you, and then obviously for the clients. And also, they will feel more secure about their own safety because, you know, you're showing that you've done everything you can to protect them. Right. Is that about cover it? It sounds like dive operators have quite a few things to stay busy with as they prepare for reopening. So these are things that they can kind of get prepared for and uh, be planning for depending on how their business flows and other factors in the mix there. And this is a good time to do it while things are slow and while you might be you know, closed until restrictions lift. This is why we would like to make this information. This is why the questions are great. It's called prepping. So, you know, while you have time to prepare, do the training, investigate the products, you know, look at your procedures, especially when it comes to boats, that you prepared for it and you're not scrambling on the first day and people are asking you questions and you feel, you know, on the spot, that maybe you've missed something. Right. And speaking of boats, a lot of people have been asking um, about our recommendations for safe dive boat operations moving forward. So what are our recommendations for those, Francois? Like, what do you have to give to our audience that can make their dive boat operations run a little bit more smoothly and still comply with social distancing and other recommendations? Okay, Kate, this is a tricky one. And I think some of the things we've said in the past have drawn some criticism because I don't think... Um, I think people are looking to us to put guidelines and, and almost rules in place, and, and we can't do that. You know, two dive, dive boats are very different, and a small dive boat needs to have enough uh, passengers, divers on board to be sustainable. You can't tell people to have one diver on board and that's all you can carry. So the reality is it's a high-risk environment for transmission, no matter what we do. And just think of your divers sitting in these seats and the wind blowing you know, as the boat steams out, and whoever's downstream of the diver up front, they're going to get you know, the particles going past them. Of course, interrogating your clients before you start remains step number one. Okay, so try to, you know, minimize the chance of having infected people on board. Then it depends on your vessel layout, whether you can get reasonable distances between people. You know, I must say that here in the US, we talk about six feet as the social distance average. In Europe, it's three feet, or certainly Italy, it's three feet. So the consensus is perhaps varied as far as that's concerned. But most likely on your boat, you're going to have less than three feet. You're going to have people sitting essentially right next to each other. So what we then have to do is look, how else can we mitigate those risks? And we're going to want to try to limit contact. So people only touch their own gear, make sure the gear is put on the boat before they get there. If they bring their own masks and snorkels and, and um, regulators, that they perhaps bring them packaged in a, in a Ziploc bag or something that will protect it while you're going out to sea and maybe somebody inadvertently touches your mask. If somebody does touch somebody's mask, you should have wipes on board to clean it off. So really, we want to restrict each person to their own equipment. You want to make sure that they sit in their seat and don't move around. And when the time comes to go diving, they get up one at a time. Remember, you'll have a staff member helping them. So that staff member might at that stage need to put a mask on, but certainly be aware of risk exposure at that time. To keep the spacing, when they get into the water, easier to have social distancing. Um, of course, underwater, we don't need to have social distancing, and not unless we're doing you know, buddy breathing or something that is obviously going to change that, that situation. Um, preventing people from touching remains a big issue. And again, when we get out the water, the staff member is going to be there to help us with our kit. So they are being exposed. So your staff member might need to be wearing gloves to protect them from your equipment. And I would say, apart from breathing on somebody or sneezing in the area, when we come up from the dive, and we all know that we kind of have to clear our, never mind clearing the mask, we have to clear our sinuses and everything else. So there's going to be mucus and stuff lying around in the water. And there we really want to make sure that people keep their distance. And if you have a line out the back of the boat because there's a current, then that's a good place to mark off six six foot intervals on the on the rope. It's really not difficult to do. And that at that stage, social distancing, I think, is you know, about as, as realistic as you can get. But the bottom line is there is no one size fits all. Ultimately, I don't mind who wants to take this up with me, but ultimately the boat operator is responsible for the clients and their staff. And no, none of us can prevent infection unless you take steps to mitigate that. And social distancing 
is not going to work in all cases, then you need to look to other remedies. We've heard people um, in other webinars talk about keeping your second stage in your mouth. I guess you know if you're really concerned, then you start breathing from your cylinder before you before you leave. That might be a bit extreme, but it's up to you. You might then make your your clients all wear masks, which will protect other people, but not necessarily protect them. So it's not an easy thing to answer. That's probably why people see a whole bunch of recommendations from us and they're assuming we're telling them to do everything. We're not. We really want you to have a look at where are you at risk and then manage that particular risk. So I can't give you a black and white answer, but I can tell you not to, not to overthink this too much, but there is certainly this work that you can do and briefing your clients. Stay in your seat, please. Don't touch other people's equipment. Please follow instructions when you do your body checks. Follow what your training agencies tell you to do. Remember that touching someone else's equipment is not really what we want to be doing at this stage. Um, and you know, a lot of just really common sense things. But there's no reason why one shouldn't be able to resume those operations when restrictions have been lifted. That was a difficult one, Caitlin. Right, but it's a very relevant one. And a lot of um, our members have been asking us about that. So really, thank you for that. Um, Friends, well, we also have a publication up on dan.org slash COVID-19 um, that details a lot of these frequently asked questions. Um, and the dive vote one is one of that. So if you guys are looking for some more information or something written, uh, we'd encourage you guys to all visit that. And we picked a few of the questions from that. That document is full of many, many more. So if you do have questions, we encourage you to check that out, but also to send them our way now. And um, at this point, we're going to get to some of our questions in the audience and thank you to those who have submitted them. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and let you guys know all of the medical questions. Um, unfortunately, we are not medical professionals in this webinar, but we would like you to direct those to medic at dan.org and our medics will be happy to assess any of those questions, whether it's about fitness to return to diving um, or your own personal situation. They are the experts there and they will be able to get back to you on that. Um, and for insurance and membership questions, you guys can contact member at dan.org. And again, we're not licensed insurance agents, unfortunately, so we can't speak on insurance in this, but our member services reps are standing by and they are more than happy to answer your questions. But I have quite a few on here that are pretty good. So we're gonna go ahead and start. Are you guys ready? Francois? I'm here. Okay, perfect. So Alberto is asking, uh, he's saying, I believe the most risk for instructors and students around will be when clearing masks um, before the dives. A lot of times mucus comes out from divers, it floats around um, when you're getting classes. What is the best way to handle this? Okay, well, I think logically the best way to handle this is not to put your mask in a communal bucket. So at this stage from the dive operator, probably a good time to have some defogging agent that everybody uses. They take care of their own masks. They can clear them when they get into the water, when they're away from other people, but this is not a good place um, to have a communal area where people are clearing with saliva, which is the, you know, the most effective way for most of us. We don't want that to go into a, into a communal bucket. Even if it has a good disinfectant in it, disinfectants are very effective, but it needs to be immersed. And if some of that is floating on the surface, you know, and somebody else happens to put their stuff in at the same time, uh, not, not something you really would encourage as we have done that in the past. And it doesn't mean in the past that we've done it correctly either. You know, infection control has now been made more of an issue and COVID notwithstanding, as we go forward, we need to think about these practices for all sorts of other effective reasons. Exactly. So perfect. Um, another question we're getting is from Benjamin. He says, how would you recommend handling seasick patrons both on the boat and vomiting in the water? Should it be handled according to standard practices of hazardous bodily fluids or with greater care because of this pandemic? Um, and do we have any recommendations for handling gear afterwards? Like, I guess if somebody were to vomit through a second stage regular, is there any particular way we recommend separating that gear out or uh, handling it? Chloe, do you want to take that or shall I? So, well, in terms of the second part of the question, the disinfection part, um, you know, a lot of these disinfectants that are on e the EPA's list and specifically for fighting COVID, you know, they're like hospital-grade disinfectants. A lot of them, you know, that it's not, it's not, they're not just going to kill 
the coronavirus. They're going to kill a lot more stuff. So in terms of handling, you know, if someone has, has vomited through a second stage, um, you know, just regular dis disinfection protocols should really um, take care of that in terms of just that part of that question if you're using a, a disinfectant. Um, Francois, I don't know, you might be better to answer the first part of that question. In terms of managing seasick patients? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I think the protocol changes much in the sense you want to control it and you don't want people to, you know, to vomit on other people. So you're going to get them to a side of the boat or somewhere where or to the head where they can actually get rid of what they need to get rid of. However, this time we are concerned, although this is picking it up from liquids itself, you need to really to aspirate it is going to be the bigger issue. But when people do vomit, then you know, there's going to be some some form of aerosolized particles around. So they need to be on their own. And if anybody's going to stand near them, they need to be aware that if they do vomit, you, it could be a hazardous time. And your your um, need for social distancing at that stage is going to be elevated. So you want people to stand away and not, you know, I know we want to comfort each other, but that's probably not the time to be doing that. And then when you get into the water, just maybe to touch on what other people have asked in the past, sea water is not going to disinfect the virus. So you want to keep away from wherever that vomit has been. And even if that means moving the boat or depending obviously where you are on the operation, you want to give a wide berth to, to that particular area. All true. And sometimes not when just pertaining to COVID times, but in general. Um, but all good ways to handle that kind of stuff. Thanks for answering that, guys, and tag teaming that. Um, it looks like the next question coming in um, is almost more... Um, asking about PPE on boats. So um, like we said, we recommend people maintaining social distancing, but is, do we have any recommendations for personal protective equipment that people can wear on dive boats that would theoretically limit their risk or any thoughts on that? Well, I think that's probably an individual question for people to think about. We know that gloves will protect the person, not anybody else. So if you are um, concerned, and especially maybe on a smaller boat, you might want to put your gloves on before you dive, if you dive with gloves, or, you know, wear your disposable gloves. It's probably a really good idea while the boat is anchored or moored when you're getting on that people use their face masks. The only two real bits of PPE we have are going to be face masks and gloves. We don't, we're not probably that concerned about eye protection unless you're working with areas where there's going to be, you know, an opportunity for something to, to shoot directly at you. And apart from that, Caitlin, I can't really think, um, one could debate a little bit the face mask, whether you're going to use the regular surgical mask or perhaps, um, and this might apply to a small boat, it might be the right opportunity to wear in the future when the hospitals are restocked and we don't have a shortage, but you're in 95 or one of the other types of masks that's more effective at protecting you as well as the people around you. That, that, that's a good question to answer and gives you time to reflect on perhaps changing some of the PPE that we wear at the moment, where we try to protect others, to where we need to protect ourselves too. True that. Um, well, that was a great answer to that, Francois, and I think a lot of people will really benefit from that. Um, another question coming in, this one's from Gayla. She says, and uh, we did hit on some of this in our previous webinar and through some of our disinfection um, articles before, but she's wondering how dive operators should handle the tubs that people use to wash gear after diving, and how will valet diving operations handle washing gear after diving, or how should they? Yeah, so um, in this case, you know, it's probably best that we don't rinse potentially contaminated equipment in a communal rinse tank, right? And it's actually a really, really easy solution, is to just perform disinfection first and then rinse in fresh water. And you'll find that most of these disinfectants, if you read the directions, they say to disinfect it X, Y, and Z ways, and then rinse in fresh water. So it's gonna be easy to keep the rinse tank from becoming too contaminated. It's gonna be an easy way to follow the directions. And like I said, if you have someone with their own personal gear who doesn't wanna use your disinfectant, for whatever reason, um, they can take their equipment home with them. If you're at a resort, you know, they can even take it back to their room. You can offer to spray it with a hose or something, um, but disinfection first, then rinsing is, is the easy solution. Perfect. And then Bob wants to know, what is the safe soak time for dive locker equipment that's going to be used repeatedly throughout the day? Kind of a follow-up on that first disinfection question. 
Chloe, it's all yours. Yes, yeah, sorry, I was hearing a little bit of feedback. Um, yeah, so that's really just going to depend on the disinfectant that you're using. Um, a lot of them have different directions for dilution, different directions for soak time. Um, so you're just, yeah, you're just going to have to kind of pick your disinfectant and, uh, disinfectant and then follow the directions. I can't give a, a standard time. But, but just, to add, add, just to add to that, oh gosh, the, um, some of them will be one minute, but it doesn't mean just slop it in and slop it out. It really means one minute Im immersion. And some of those tend to be a bit stronger, so you don't really want to leave it in there for longer than, than about a minute. Some of them are 10 minutes, or five or 10 minutes. And again, you're not going to keep monitoring that with a stopwatch, but please, if it says five to 10 minutes, there's a reason for that, and you want to adhere to those times. And then it wasn't part of the question. Most of these disinfectants are only really effective when you disinfect, you rinse, and you allow it to dry. And they all three of those steps are important to happen. Of course, if you're using the same equipment throughout the day, drying is not so easy. But try to get it in a place where it can dry, in other words, in the sun somewhere. Don't put it in a ventilated area. That doesn't help the virus from actually you know, being completely rendered ineffective. But the drying is part of the disinfection step. So it's not intended for you just to dump it in a bucket, rinse it out, and then put it back on again. Right. And uh, speaking of letting disinfectants sit on surfaces uh, and giving enough time to evaporate and things like that, we mentioned earlier when we were talking about um, practices for disinfecting cylinders before filling um, about not using alcohol um, due to the risk of fire. And I, I think we might need to clarify that. Um, and apologies if you weren't asking about this, Ivan, but he says, I think the comments on wipes and alcohol sanitizers may be overkill. It seems to me if we allow adequate time for the alcohol to evaporate, we should be fine. What are your thoughts on that, Francois? Sure. And, and, and yeah. this could be me pertaining to surfaces within the dive shop, um, but I, I feel like it's important to clarify um, what alcohol can be put on it and should be avoided. Sure. Oh, good, good question. So in areas where you're not dealing with compressed gas, alcohol is a great disinfectant. It's even great on your on your diet gear when you you know want to put it onto your hose whip or your the interface in your cylinder valve. However, if you're asking me to give my opinion, I have to bear in mind that you get conscientious people like the person that sent the question in, and then you get careless people. And it's for the careless people that I'm concerned. If you're a conscientious person, you don't put you know deeps heaps of alcohol um, disinfectant on there, and you wipe it off, which is all you need to do, and you give it a couple of seconds to evaporate properly, and you haven't put on huge amounts of liquid that will go into the, into the cracks and crevices and the um, enclosed spaces, 100% correct. I, I have experience from another field completely unrelated to this, what we call hyperbaric medicine. We have exactly the same, the same issue. Many hospitals use alcohol-based disinfectants, and if you're vigilant and you're aware of the risk, then by all means, you can use it. I'm, I'm not going to say that it's always going to burst into flame. My concern is the careless person. So if you maintain discipline and you limit that to the staff, absolutely. If you allow you know, clients to put this on their hands and disinfect their own cylinder valve, then I would get nervous. Right. And uh, this is a follow-up question that has to do with the same kind of subject. Um, Yvonne is asking, is their disinfection not suitable for oxygen clean gear? So something that would be flammable, I'm assuming. Um, but are there any red flag ones that you should definitely not use with oxygen clean gear? Anything with what we call a volatile substance, volatile organic compound, um, anything that in the presence of normal atmospheric temperature is going to turn into a vapor and that's going to be flammable. And maybe the alcohol-based, ethanol-based, a range of them that are the SDS on the safety data sheet will indicate to you your, your um, vapor temperature when it will turn into a vapor. And you must regard that as being flammable in most cases. But there are many, many other disinfectants um, out there that we have in our wipes. You don't really want to mention Clorox because it really is not a pleasant thing unless you have lots of time for it to dry. But some of the other um, benzo-related products, we call them quaternary agents, they are certainly going to be more than compatible with um, high-pressure gases, oxygen, whatever else you want to use. A part of the question I probably can't answer correctly is, are there disinfecting agents that might react in the presence of high percentages of oxygen? Um, because oxygen being a rapid oxidizer. 
I know the safety data sheet will tell you if it is sensitive to oxidation, but as I sit here answering the question, it's something that I'd have to admit that I would need to go and research. And I'd, if you tell me the disinfectant you'd like to use, then it's relatively easy from the safety data sheet to determine whether you're going to have a risk there or not. Perfect. So if folks at home have questions about specific disinfectants, we'll just encourage them to email us individually um, to ask about specific ones. Again, that email for all of you guys sitting in our audience is riskmitigation at dan.org, and uh, our team will be happy to get back to you. That It's a, a little bit easier um, to get back on a case-by-case -case basis than to go through and name some, but looks like we don't have any necessarily red flag do not use at the moment, but um, again, just be sure to read up on any disinfectant you plan to use um, before using it. And uh, one question that has been asked several times that we'll get to, and this might be our last question we get to during this live webinar, is what effects does salt water have on this virus? Can it survive? Do we know? What's going on with that, guys? Shall I, shall I try and then we can fill in all the gaps? <laughs> that sounds great to me. Yes. yes. Directly, the answer is we're not quite sure when it comes to COVID-19, this particular virus, but there's been a huge amount of work done um, in the past, specifically to do with waste management and wastewater getting out into the sea. The reality is the sea can have all sorts of bacteria and bugs and viruses existing in it. The sea is not going to disinfect um, or sanitize most of the stuff that you throw in there. There's some stuff that will be sensitive to heat and to sodium chloride, but we know that you can get seawater that will make you sick. So, no, the putting salt in is really not going to assist you. If you we just step one, one step back from that and move away from seawater to swimming pools, if you use sodium chloride, in other words, salt, in your swimming pool, and it, then the process is, you know, that turns, it essentially separates the chlorine from the sodium, and you get chlorine gas, that, that would be uh, more effective at sanitizing. But seawater itself is not what we would call either a sanitizer or a disinfectant. Kobe, have you come across anything else to add to that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just pretty unclear right now, especially since this is such a new virus. Um, a lot, yeah. And again, a lot of the research that has been done on coronaviruses or other viruses with a viral envelope um, really have to do with wastewater and wastewater treatment. Um, and yeah, this this virus is just too new for us to really have a, a very solid answer. Gotcha. Well, thanks for answering that, guys. I know a lot of people out there um, were waiting on that one. So it looks like we are running short on time, unfortunately. So if we did not answer your question during this live webinar, we apologize in advance, and we will do our best to get back to you as soon as we can. Um, for those of you who may be tuning in later and watching this video um, in the recorded versions, just go ahead and remember that if you have any questions about dive medicine, uh, fitness to dive, or returning to diving after COVID-19, please reach out to our medical department at medic at dan.org. Um, if you guys have questions on insurance or membership, feel free to direct those to member at dan.org. And again, all other questions about diving operations and prepping for a return to diving um, post lockdown, shoot those to our two experts we had on this webinar today at risk mitigation at dan.org. Um, do you guys have any last statements to close this one out or? Maybe if I can just really wind back just so that the person that asked the question about the cylinder, there was something I meant to add. Some people think that the pressure in the cylinder alone is going to destroy the virus. Well, bad news is you need 60 to 90,000 PSI pressure, and that's been researched. So we know from research that the coronavirus per se will eventually, after 30 minutes or so, um, be destroyed by pressure. So sadly, our scuba cylinders are not going to do that for us. But now my last word, words would be, if you take the advice, if you look for the real issues in your, in your operation and you address those real issues, if you don't panic that there are 10,000 things that you need to do, almost everything we would do is common sense. And remember, you want people to dive with you. So if you show them that you're concerned about their health and safety and their health and welfare, then what you do is going to be really great marketing and, and giving people the, the, the opportunity or the desire to come back and dive with you. Very, very true. Thanks for that, Francois. 
Well, with that, guys, we're going to close out, but thanks for tuning in. Again, apologies for our audio issues, but thanks to everyone who stuck with us till the end. And uh, this isn't the last webinar, so stay tuned, guys. We're going to be coming out with another one next week. Have a great one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.